Hello, I'm Jeffrey. This is Auto Alchemy, and I'm doing another typing video today. Today I'm going to be looking at the comedian Giannis Papas. I don't know a ton about him. I think he has a podcast or two of his own. Um, for context, this video is one in a series of videos where I've been looking at um, people who are being typed or who have been typed an objective personality and kind of seeing how much of their seeing how much of their type I can see even in a short clip of that person. So in this case, I'm looking at someone who is actually about to be typed. And so I will do part one of the video where will be me attempting to type them. And then part two of the video will be me reflecting on what I did well, what I did wrong after the type is revealed. So I'm filming this across a couple of days. So in any case, um, that's your context. What else do you need to know? Um, I'm trying, yeah, like I said, I'm trying to pull out as much of their type from a short clip as possible. I'm also trying to be a little bit quicker about these videos because they tend to run on long, even if I'm doing a six minute video, it ends up being, if I'm analyzing six minutes, it turns into 40 minutes of content. So if we don't want that, I'm defeating the purpose right here as I'm talking. So yeah, we're looking at uh, the Lex Friedman podcast. I looked at some of these little headers and I was kind of interested in what he had to say about dogs as somebody who kind of likes dogs myself. Um, so yeah, and for context here, <laughs> for context, for context, Lex Friedman is a uh, double masculine ENTP, consume, sleep, blast, play, so that might be an interesting counterpoint. Notice the um, very catatonic face here of the double activated sleep. Yeah, and you know what, dogs is something I don't think people really understand enough about. It's one of my obsessions, so... Um, they, they, my dad always used to say those, he goes, those things are, those things are based. So already I'm feeling a little biased because he's reminding me of someone, but on the plus side, that's someone who hasn't actually ever been typed in the objective personality system, at least to my knowledge. So he's, there's something about him that is giving me Patton Oswalt vibes. Now, I do have a theory about what Patton Oswalt's type is, so now that's going to start coloring the way that I'm seeing this guy. Um, okay, let me start this little clip over. They, I, they understand enough about. It's one of my obsessions. So, and you know what? Dogs is something I don't think people really understand enough about. It's one of my obsessions. So um, they, I, they, my dad always used to say, those, he goes, those things, are, those things are basically human. Okay. I mean, I feel like I could... I'm gonna to try to pull a lot out of that. So um, people don't understand enough about dogs. Well, when you say, you know, dogs is like my favorite topic or one of my obsessions, um, that makes me wonder a little bit about whether this person is an observer, especially knowing that he likes history. You know, observers are more con concerned with facts and happenings and theories and generally speaking, the information. So. So there's that, um, but at the same time, the, you know, the question is, is he taking the interpretation of dogs in a more decidery way? Because you can clearly take it both ways. Some people will talk about dogs as, you know, as things. And some people will talk about dogs as man's best friend. So I'm not sure what direction he's gonna take it, but this is what, what I'm thinking and like a distinction that I'm gonna start looking for with him. And I mean, they dream, they have anxiety, uh, and what people often overlook about dogs is without... Oh, yeah, another thing that I was pulling out of that beginning was, you know, he's like, um, people don't understand enough about dogs. So I tend to think of understanding as being more of an, an intuition thing. Um, like the whole notion that I get it. I get something that other people don't get. So he's positioning himself as the one who is the understanding one, the one who has kind of the bird's eye view on the situation, um, perhaps because he has a bunch of sensory facts. I don't know, but it seems more intuition skewed currently. Um, he also mentioned, you know, like dogs are my obsession. I have an obsession for dogs. There was like a quick little, you know, this is one of my things, one of my things. I, I saw some DI there. And then when he was talking about his dad's perspective on dogs. Um, maybe some slowdown. I'm talking about dad. Could be wrong though. Without dogs, we wouldn't be here. We would not have ever evolved.
from hunter gatherer to agrarian to you know um, civ civilization. Without dogs, we wouldn't be here. Um, going to regurgitate something I said in my Rana video, the last typing video I did, but that's a very broad statement. That's a very intuitive kind of statement. You can't, if, if you if you say that to someone, you're not really telling them any of the who, what, when, where, why, like those are the questions that I feel like the censors really get off on. They really sink their teeth into those questions and want to know more about that information. And so, you know, he's given us an overview. I don't want to make the mistake that I made with Rana where she was doing some overview talk, but she was more activated when actually giving concrete examples. So, you know, you, you have to be careful with how you're interpreting things. Um, but what makes me feel, you know, I already had that one point for observation or for intuition when I said that he was positioning himself as the one who understands compared to other people. Um, he just gave me kind of an overview and then I'm seeing some slowdown on examples. So let's see. We wouldn't have cities. We wouldn't have anything. I mean, they are our partner in civilization. We wouldn't have. Right, right, right. So to agrarian, to, you know, um, civ civilization. When he's trying to give these concrete examples um, of different stages where dogs have been valuable for human beings, there's a lot of slowdown. Um, even I'm struggling now to recall what he just said, you know, hunter gatherer to agrarian to civilization. Um, and I think he also did it earlier when he was trying to humanize dogs. Humanize dogs makes me think maybe decider. Yeah. Um, so he was trying to humanize the dogs and he said that they experience anxiety and I think he said they have dreams. And I don't know if he gave another example beyond that, but it was a similar state change of slowing down. So I feel like I'm trying to pull a lot out of a little, a little amount. We wouldn't have cities. We wouldn't have anything. I mean, they are our partner in survival and they are a magical animal. There's no, there's no animal that was, it was like destiny. Magical animal. Um, Again, that's kind of like an intuitive statement. It's not just the fact that he's saying those words, magical animal, but he's like compressing a lot of information into that statement. Um, and information, uh, compressing information about like the depth of that relationship. And, um, and so anyway, it's not just that he's saying it, but it's also that he's saying it like very casually, very quickly. There's not a lot of slowdown on the processing. Me almost. Mm -hmm. I mean, a malleable animal. There's no animal that's that malleable that in a few generations you can tailor to a specific job that you need. And without that animal, without dogs doing that animal, protecting our crops from, from uh, you know, uh, scavengers and stuff like that. So another place where he kind of slowed down um, when trying to think of like a specific example scavengers um and then he didn't even he didn't even push forward you know it's like and stuff like that intuitives will often kind of like give up on the i need to pull some examples up from the well they kind of just do a little hand wave you know what i mean and stuff like that everybody you know you can figure out that part yourself that's not what my comfort zone is and so that's something that i'm seeing here and yeah it's just not the same experience as I was feeling with Rana last week where save your SE really just enjoying giving the examples and falling into like that sing song state and not wanting to leave that comfort zone. So, you know, the list goes on. We <laughs> the sensory list goes on. We wouldn't be here. So we, oh, that's an, what's more important here is a statement without dogs, we wouldn't be here. So that's sort of the, um, yeah, that's the summary, the intuitive overview. We wouldn't be here. Um, yeah. Often overlooked fact that human evolution was not uh, done in a vacuum just with humans. I mean, without dogs, we would have never evolved. I mean, we weren't the apex predator for most of our existence. We weren't even the apex predator. I mean, we're getting eaten by hyenas, which is my favorite animal. Um, <laughs> Nice little like 
brief channel change there. Um, mentioned hyenas, and then, by the way, that's my favorite animal. Um, you know, it reminds me of something at the very beginning of this little clip where he also, like, managed to bring in that same kind of, like, dogs, and I love dogs, they're my favorite. Um, my favorite animal, you know, he, ha <laughs> he has a list. Somewhere there's a list of animals. Um, I don't know, that's making me think F.I.? I know that's like, I know that's kind of dangerous. I don't, you know, you can have a favorite animal and not be Savior F.I., but am I going to see a lot of thinking from this person? So far, I haven't seen a lot of thinking. I haven't seen a lot of what are the steps we need to take to solve a problem or build an abstract model that does solve some sort of conceptual problem. Not seeing that. Oh, man, you know, that's kind of an injustice to, I mean, I'm kind of mad at dogs that I, we deserve to get eaten by hyenas. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I mean, that's a perfect little follow-up to what I just said. Um, you threw the word injustice in there, so now we're kind of in the realm of the, of the ethical. Um, he threw the concept of deserving in there. Uh, he's kind of mad. I don't remember what he's mad about, but he also like very quickly and casually was able to talk about that emotional state. So I'm seeing someone who is more value driven. Um, yeah, don't hold me to that. <laughs> but I, I think I'm feeling pretty confident about that. But without dogs, we wouldn't be here. And dogs, dogs deserve the protection. So do horses. They fucking lugged us around for thousands. Dogs and horses deserve protection. Deserve. These are valuable things that we should cherish and we should have these, we should prioritize And now these fucking German psychopaths are eating them or whatever. We should not eat horse meat just on like, be a good dude, man. Okay, so yeah, no argument there. Just like, be a good dude. And there's like that exasperation. The, there's a sing-song equality there too, right? Like, And these things lugged us around for generations. Yeah. They're beautiful. You know, Ron he's on a, he's on a roll in the same way that Rana was on a roll last week with talking about the examples. He's giving us some like, here's what we should not do from an ethical perspective. Item or I don't know, I don't know, but I, it it rubs me the wrong way that we eat horses. Rubs me the wrong way. You know, that's it. That's the bottom line. I don't need to articulate some sort of like philosophical, rational argumentation. It just rubs me the wrong way. Save your fi. Yeah, the the horses one is interesting. And one of my favorite books is Animal Farm by Orwell, and the horses don't get a good ending in that. Uh, I kind of, uh, my spirit animal, I suppose, is the horse from Animal Farm, uh, Boxer, where he says, uh, I will work harder. That's his motto. I, I work really hard uh, at stupid things. So he's not playing. So Lex, like I said, is an ENTP, consume, sleep, blast, play. Um, what does he really focus on there? He's focusing on the idea of the the horse not deserving or being undeserving of a particular kind of treatment, but for some reason he's focusing on this idea of working hard. You know, I often associate thinking with working because work is intended to accomplish something and to effectively work, you have to break down the work into different tasks and think about, you know, the just the best like if then trajectory to accomplish the job. That's, that's basically what I did. I just hit my head against the wall for no reason whatsoever. But that probably fulfills, you have a big brain, you were probably born with a big brain that kind of fulfills. Yeah, it's just killing neurons. It's exercise for you. Yeah. Yes. yes. Just, Don't you think some animals deserve to be eaten though? Kind of like hyenas? <laughs> Come on, dude. I mean, they, 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 so you gotta is... respect the hyena. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we're talking about deserving again. You know, deserving, I just think deserving is a very feeling based concept and you know I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past him if this guy was actually you know feeling third you know I I could talk about deserving as somebody who has FE as my as my third function but it'll just be a different state you know it'll be an odd state in some way and I think this guy is like very like casually and even playfully exploring the idea of who deserve who deserves what I don't want to belabor the point Come on. Okay, so let's let, first of all, let me just comment on the dog thing. There is like conferences on dog cognition from a perspective of people that study psychology, cognitive science, neuroscience. Dogs are fascinating. 
the way they move their eyes, they're able to, they're the only other animal besides humans, they're able to communicate with their eyes. They can look at a thing and look back at you and look back at the thing to communicate that we're all like, through our eyes communicate that we're collaborating. So uh, every other animal uses their eyes to actually look at things. The dogs use it to like communicate with you, with us humans. It's fascinating. There's a lot of other elements of dogs that are amazing. Yeah, I mean, if it wasn't for them, uh, we, they're the ones, they were our first alarm system for predators. They would defend us. I mean, the Basenji is one of the most ancient dogs. I mean, they're... So all I'm really taking away is I feel like Lex had more of an observer take on dogs. Like, listen to this cool factoid about dogs. And it's a very, like, you know, he's somebody who has his ST functions, uh, animal rather, above his NF animal. And it was a very kind of like scientific statement of here's how it is. And there's none of the like emotional vibey connection that Yana seems to have towards dogs. So that's interesting. Um, and yeah, more just like here is the observation. Here's the kind of neutral delivery of the fact or the overview. And um, I don't remember what Giannis just said here, but it seems like... They were our first alarm system for predators. They would defend us. I mean, the Basenji is one of the most ancient dogs. I mean, they're tiny, but they're fearless. Yeah. And they would chase off lions. Like, you know, there'd be packs of them, and they'd chase off lions and protect the tribes. It's... it's it's. I even get tingles, like, thinking about dogs, because I, I have a dog. I love my dog. It's just... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get tingles thinking about the dogs. I, I don't know. Um... The only hesitation I have towards calling this guy savior thinking is that maybe this is like, I feel like people who are savior thinking will often like pour all of their emotional, um, all of their value, their feeling function into something like animals or babies. And that's like the level of how refined it is. So I don't know. But again, you know, I love my dog. and da, 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 da. It just still seems so like, you know, it just doesn't feel like it has like negative charge. It feels casual and easy. I don't know how, how else to put it. And there's something about when you're walking with your dog off leash in the woods, it like, there's something about it that's like, that that tugs at that uh, millions of years of evolution, like that gut, you know, it's yeah. like, I had a, a Finnish friend of mine, he's a comic, Tommy Valamis once told me. Seeing more like NF, like the gut, you know, there's just like a vibe, there's a feeling there's a sense and you know spe specifically you can't like nail it down in st terms but that I mean, is what it is he was like uh he was like the gut he's like I, I believe in the like that gut you know when you have that feeling he's like always trust that because that is million those are all your ancestors that's the survival instinct of all your ancestors at the beginning of time you know telling you like hey something's off here something's you know so don't get in the car with ted bundy is what i'm saying ladies how fucking <laughs> stupid who, how can you fall for that? You know, he's got a fucking sling on. Don't get in. Yeah. <laughs> Sky is, um, I feel like I'm seeing kind of a lot of channel changing. Like he allows himself to make those shifts. And so, yeah, kind of tough, but especially when he was talking about, oh, this is my favorite and this is my favorite. And he doesn't really seem to, to have like, a path in the conversation he just kind of like finds it as he goes and then being you know a funny guy I, i'm also inclined to see that more in like nf terms not that every comedian is is nf but um yeah it, that just feels more appropriate than you know something like jim carrey who is an st comedian and his form of comedy is more along the lines of like I'm going to do something so random and something with my face that you can see. And it's like very real and it's not as conceptual, you know, like the Ted Bundy joke is, you know, a little more, a little out there, you know, like the connection wasn't immediately obvious. You kind of had to like take a few steps to get there. And that's why I'm inclined to see it as more intuitive. Yeah, you follow the gut. My yeah. question to you, are psychopaths essentially robots? So first of all, let's not, you're using okay and so you know another like little a little leap i like that he's asking lex a question because that makes me think maybe you know he's kind of comfortable with being like i'm comfortable pinging other people playing with other people um playing not at the bottom i'm not 100 percent on that um 
but okay, I like that he said, are psychopaths robots? So psychopath, like that's a very decidery fixation, right? Um, there are people in this world who are all good, all bad, you know, deciders kind of get, can get caught up on that and either processing that fact or then processing the opposite revelation of like, wait a second, not everybody is so black and white and we really, you know, double deciders kind of like from the jump have this sense of like, yeah, you know, we all have this monstrous capacity within us, but we can also do great things. And yeah, there are some people who are psychopaths and blah, blah, blah. Just not really getting as um, fixated on that kind of conversational topic. So he's talking about psychopaths now and um, connecting psychopathy to an ST perspective. So like if he's a decider, it's like, okay, there are bad people in the world. Maybe they're psychopaths. Maybe they are robots. They're ST, um, you know, kind of tongue in cheek, I say that. And um, yeah, so that, you know, if the bad bad guys in the story might be more ST than the good guys in the story are going to be more NF and they're going to be more value centric and so on and so forth. So just something to think about. I'll see. I don't, let's see how Lex takes the robot comment. In the word robot in a derogatory way that I feel, no, I'm, 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 I'm triggered by. Okay? Yeah, you, <laughs> I feel you offended. Be, you should be because, you know what, people are always scared of robots, but I, I actually, uh, I have, I've made the sort of, uh, I, I, I've made it to say, hey, I've, I thought about it. I'm like, robot, robots have been nothing but helpful. Yeah. It's the people we should be scared of. Right. Again, we're kind of missing the oh. most destructive thing is us. Cause okay. Yeah, so the people are the are what we should fear. You know, robots or whatever. Robots are helpful. This is reminding me a little bit of Rana in the last video who would talk about, you know, how apps and AI can fill in a particular void for us, you know. Rana was trying to fill in the ethical void, creating some app or some technology that would make emotionally intelligent AI. So she was trying to fill in the, the value-centric void. And for her, technology could fill in the NT void or the thinkerly void. And he's saying, I think, kind of the same thing, you know. Thankfully, robots can, like, fill in some of the void for us. And he's not taking this in an observer direction. He's taking it in the direction of people. So... We can rely on these tools to help us out with our thinky weaknesses. But robots are helpful. I mean, this is a fucking robot. You know, I went on hotel tonight. I'm already booked up. You know, I got my, I can change my flight. If, if this barbecue with Rogan goes 16 hours, which whatever Rogan wants to do, I'll do. If he wants to kick me in the chest, I'll let him kick me in the chest, whatever. Um, <laughs> robots are helpful, no? Yeah. <laughs> no? Uh, tanks and autonomous weapon systems don't kill people. People kill people. People kill people, yeah. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the NRA is about to click that for you. <laughs> uh, a lot of love for dogs. I appreciate it very much. And at the same time, you have the other thing that people seem to have love for, which is cats. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side of everything you've said, I'm trying to understand what have cats ever done for human civilization? <laughs> they keep rodents away. The domesticated cat is very important. It keeps rodents away. Yeah, that's what they were domesticated for. I mean, they're psychopathic killers who end up killing... Uh, Again, psychopathic. Okay, so I have I have two cats and I love cats, but I also like dogs. Not going to take this too much to heart. Um, I think I'm actually going to stop there because I feel like I have enough that I could kind of work with. Um, so let's see. Maybe how do I turn off one of these screens? No. Nope. So... Um, I'm not sure on intuition versus sensing, because I think I could be misreading the state changes, but the fact that those two seem closer to me inclines me to believe that those functions are in the middle. Originally, I wanted to see this guy as an ENFP, but I've revised that perception. So now I'm seeing sensing and intuition maybe in the middle. I didn't even get into this guy's interest in history, but people have a tendency to treat their third function as a hobby. So I could see someone with SI third being invested in history and, you know, coming into history, whereas the comedy is kind of like his meat and potatoes and maybe making abstract connections and being a funny guy in that respect and leaving reality a little bit. So, so what I'm saying is 
decider with clearly with uh, intuition and sensing somewhere in the middle. Um, I, you know, I don't want to go like all in on saying DI, um, but at the same time, I don't really have a lot else to go on. So hang on, let's see. I do feel like feeling at the top, he did show himself to be, you know, concerned with ethical matters and, and does what, who deserves what, what deserves what, what is a psychopath? You know, how do, how do robots fit into this? What is an injustice? What is not an injustice? Um, I will say NF. Yeah, NF type, feeling at the top. Um, I think it's more on the channel changey side, more on the, like, oh, let's jump to a new topic. Let's jump to a new topic. Um, so OE, so any, um, ooh, saw some of the play in there. I don't know about information versus energy. I guess he comes across as someone who has a lot to say. I don't know. He doesn't strike me as an introverted part person. Let's call him maybe info dominant. I mean, if he has like this podcast where he's so interested in history, like, I mean, <laughs> I know that what I'm saying here is very tentative and tenuous. Um, I also don't think that he was that great at like, uh, I don't know. This seems more right to me. INFP consume play sleep blast or maybe ESFJ play consume sleep blast. Um, I don't know about the modalities. I don't like the modalities. It's my least favorite part of OPS. So in any case, um, <laughs> just to play it safe because so many people tend to have those modalities, I'm going to say that he's one of these two types and um, I'll hope for the best. I think more likely it's FI. Like if I really had to bet on it, I would say that he's here and and if I really had to bet on it, I might even say uh, MF. Uh, I don't know why. No, I'll, I'll leave it at FF. Okay, so anyway, uh, I did manage to make this one a little bit shorter. I'm going to stop talking now and uh, have a follow-up very shortly. So goodbye. All right, so part two. Giannis Papas, how did I do? Um, I think I did pretty well overall. So as you can see, I typed him as an INFP. Double feminine, consume, play, sleep, blast, and he ended up being very close to my type, actually. Um, ENTP, consume, play, blast, sleep, and his modalities were MF. So, close but no cigar, as I wrote here. Um, I don't feel too bad about the pieces that I got wrong for Giannis, primarily because I, at some point in the original video, I had considered all of the correct pieces you know, pretty strongly. So at the end of my video, uh, when I was locking in my guess, I originally put him down as info dominant and I put him down as consume play blast sleep. Something caused me to hesitate and I ended up revising that, but I was on the right track. Um, one of my reason, one of my reasons being that he didn't strike me as being particularly introverted and somebody who is blast last is going to be more introverted, especially compared to someone who is sleep last. So I thought I saw some more extroverted energy, you know, despite him being an INFP, according to my original guess. Um, and now, you know, I watched myself watching the clip. And in doing that, I could really see all the places where I was a little kind of missing the info dominant nature of the conversation. It's really clear that he's someone who has collected this assemblage of facts, concepts, ideas, whatever you want to call them. He has a bunch of little lessons that he's then giving back to the audience. Here's something interesting about dogs. Here's something interesting about hyenas. Here's something interesting about humans not always being the apex predator. And here's something interesting about how dogs have 
you know, really been integral in our evolution as human beings, yada, 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 so on and so forth, right? So there was just a lot of that. And it's not to say that people who are blast last don't also have a bunch of random things that they've consumed and accumulated. They definitely do, but they're going to struggle more when it comes to that next step of bridging with an audience, bridging with another human being, presenting those ideas in a way that is accessible, um, assim assimilatable. I don't know if that's uh, the proper, <laughs> proper use of that word or if that's even the word, something that can be assimilated. And um, yeah, so as an info dominant, he was playing that game pretty well of here's what I consumed and here, let me give it back to you. And hopefully in a way that is going to be digestible, much better word. So in any case, I think I'm doing the sleep last thing right now where I'm just rolling and I'm not really pausing to take a breath. So, you know, typology in action, you can observe that and, and try to derive some conclusions from that if you'd like, or at least use me as a data point. Um, okay, so yeah, moving on, info versus energy became abundantly clear that I was looking at someone who was info dominant once I rewatched it. And I think a reason that I missed that is because, well, this is someone who's very close to my type, right? And in the early days of processing my objective personality type, and even sometimes now, I wonder, am I really blast third? I hold myself to this ridiculously high standard when it comes to my ability to communicate to other people. And I always harshly criticize myself. And so I think I was just applying the same brutal standard that I apply to myself to Giannis here. And so I thought, yeah, there's no way. Like that's where the hesitation came from was just being a little too brutal. But if I try to be objective, I can see why I maybe messed that up. Um, and so I'll just move on now. So the other thing, another thing that I dropped the ball on was thinking versus feeling. And I really, you know, I really latched on to this idea of he has like this love of dogs and he kind of went on a couple of rants about how, you know, this is an injustice and dogs don't deserve this. And this is how we respect hyenas, yada, yada, yada. My thinking being that, you know, conceptualizing the world in terms of respect and justice, who deserves what, that's sort of a feeler kind of domain. Um, and I still stand by that. But as I said in the original part of this video, I wouldn't be surprised if he's actually feeling third. Uh, and this kind of just goes back to that idea of the state changes and <clears throat> tracking state changes and interpreting them. And I think maybe I was just going a little too quickly. So I had this desire to say, okay, there it is. There's a the feeling. He's kind of like going off and he's really giving us some moralizing lessons. And, you know, I think, you know, watching back, I don't know how to put this other than other than to say that it didn't seem like he was that serious about, you know, what he was saying. And, you know, he's a comedian. So it was almost like he was saying these, you know, semi outrageous things or pretending to be outraged uh, for comedic effect. Um, let me see. I don't want to waste too much time here. Oh, I definitely don't want to do this right now anyway, because I don't have my headphones. And so the audio will get messed up. But in, in any case, you know, he's like, oh, you know, you know what animals do deserve to be mistreated, yada, yada, yada. Like, he, he kind of like giggles and he, so he's like talking about this notion of deserving and justice, but he's sort of doing it playfully and not taking it too seriously. So he's dipping his toes in that realm. Um, so I don't know if that makes any sense. Uh, the other thing that I said was that for thinkers, and this is something that I've actually read in, Carl Jung, and I've read in Marie Louise, Marie Louise von Franz, who is Jung's protege, this whole idea that thinkers will kind of often mistake themselves as feelers because they'll feel strong emotional attachment to animals or to babies. And it's like they take all of their feeling function and they kind of just funnel it into one or two particular areas and that those areas become sore spots and they become associated with the feeling. And so it's easy to mistake oneself as a feeler. Um, and so, yeah, you know, an attachment, a strong attachment to animals, that can be a sign of 
you know, a repressed feeling function trying to find whatever outlet that it can. Um, you know, what else? So I don't know that I saw a lot of evidence for thinking, and it could just be that I chose a pretty poor excerpt. Like, I say, like, active, positive evidence as opposed to trying to, like, insinuate or hypothesize that maybe thinking is there because of the absence of feeling or because of the strange charged nature of the talk about values. So the only thing that I could really think of and as a, you know, positive demonstration that thinking was present, um, I was wondering, you know, he's kind of presenting this evolution of history and how dogs have been an integral integral part of human evolution, it's almost like a mental model of how this process has functioned, right? You know, he was painting a picture and he was, you know, creating not quite a narrative, but, you know, it's like dogs were this piece in the Rubik's Cube and human beings were this piece and, you know, this part of history could not have existed. So, you know, he's sharing facts but he's a little divorced from reality itself. So he's doing kind of the overview talk and all of these different like overviews and summaries and analogies are kind of clicking in place to create a meta narrative about history and humanity. Um, so that might be a little hard to digest if you're just listening to me now, but I think there's something to what I just said. And so I'm going to have to let that percolate a little bit longer. Um, yeah, thinking versus feeling, uh, what else? Um, I don't feel bad about getting him as an INFP because he is double activated on his NF functions with his play. Um, I think it's especially funny that, you know, he was complaining about robots, you know, the ST perspective when he was talking with Lex Friedman and Lex also kind of got defensive there. Um, you know, jokingly defensive, but there's always something to a joke, right? Okay, finally, um, decider versus observer. This is kind of tough because I feel like the stuff I said about um, info versus energy might also apply. So he was definitely talking more about the observations, sharing his observations, not going too, too all in on judgment, um, what is valuable, what's not valuable. Those were detours. They were definitely present, but they were only there as detours. And so... Yeah, I don't know. Again, I think this might be a limitation of the clip that I picked, but I did, you know, he was kind of confidently talking from his personal perspective and then would occasionally bring other people in, but those other people were afterthoughts. So I don't know, maybe some double deciding there. This is definitely the, the piece that I have the hardest time justifying on the basis of what I watched. I will say, I mentioned him talking about psychopaths as possible evidence for being a decider, but that's another place where, you know, this is a comedian and it was kind of in jest and, you know, they didn't get stuck there for too long. So it was just something that he was, you know, wanting to shoot the shit about, I guess you could say. So in any case, I think I've gone on for too long processing this. So that's it for now. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.